I'm also a baseball fan, and I'm from Kansas City, so I'm a Kansas City Royals fan, where our greatest player, I think, is George Brett. So he was an all-star and a Hall of Famer. And I met him one time, and I asked him how he stayed so in the game and so concentrated and kept getting better every season. And he said, I never looked back and I never looked at what I did the season before. I was always saying, how can I get better? And that's, that's always stayed with me. I think I am looking forward to what is next and what I can lend my voice to and how I can bring it to more people, how I can sing better, how I can communicate better. It's always this quest uh, for discovery and for moving forward. It's never, never finished. Loneliness on the road is a very peculiar thing, and I think it's something um, it's very difficult for people that haven't experienced it to fully understand it. Um, when you miss your family and you miss your friends and you have, you don't have that special person to share it with, that's a loneliness that cannot be compensated with um, by fans or by even the musical experience. It's why um, you know, many singers or artists will say that they're not paid to sing, they're actually paid to be away from home. And I think that's a very accurate statement. Um, I love what I do, and it's the reason that I can endure um, life on the road. Um, it really drives me, I feel like it's a vocation for me, and sharing that with the fans is an extraordinary, wonderful experience. Um, but that belongs to my career that element of it. It doesn't belong to my personal life. I do not believe that at all that it involves dumbing down the art form or playing to the lowest, most common denominator that only singing O Mio Babino Caro and Nessun Dorma in public venues. I think we can do, we can be very true to the excellence and the Olympic art form that we're a part of. There's nothing else like it on the face of the earth today. I'll give you an example. I was in New York about a month ago, and there's a wonderful, very chic, new, hip uh, magazine that is dedicated just to the arts. There's an, it's nonprofit, so there's no advertising in it. It's amazing, and it's poetry and dance and, and fiction and, and fine arts and visual arts and opera. It's amazing, called Flat Magazine. And they were doing a launch for their new issue, and they invited me along to perform at this event. And it's a very hipster, cool, almost all under 30 group. This young, exciting, burgeoning sort of scene in New York where they all have money, but they haven't quite yet understood what philanthropy is. They haven't been invited onto the board of the Metropolitan Opera yet, but they're interested in knowing what this all is about. So I go in, it's at the National Arts Club, but they've transformed this bar into a real nightclub feel. And there's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, there's the band is going, DJ, and you can't hear anything. You can't say, what, what? Vodka is pouring out. Everybody's drinking, everybody's having a great time. And about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and it's packed shoulder to shoulder, 600 people in this cramped little room. And all of a sudden they introduce me and say, now we have the great American mezzo-soprano, Joyce DiDonato. And all of the sound is quiet, and all of a sudden you can't hear anything because this over-amplified sound is still ringing in your ear. And they lift the lid to the acoustic piano, you know, this, a little upright, uh, a baby grand piano, and there's me with no microphone. People are standing not even a meter from me, you know, 20 people deep, shoulder to shoulder, and I'm singing Tanti Affetti, an eight minute long Rossini aria that nobody in that room has heard before. You can barely hear the piano, dung ding, dung dung, and it sounds like an old tinny sort of thing. And, and I'm, what it sounds like to me is I'm because it's not a concert hall, there's not a good acoustic, but I just decided to go for it. And after the first two phrases, I start to see people's jaws just drop. And I start to see elbows going into the person next to them. And slowly cell phones come out and you see them starting to record it. And they, after a few phrases, they start applauding in the middle of lines. If I go up to a high note, they're like, Woo! 
And they, of course, had no idea of the etiquette of opera. They were responding, responding viscerally to what they were hearing. And I walked out of there, and it was, it was like the, the roof just blew off the place at the end. It was one of the most exciting performances I've ever given, the most surprising. And I walked out of there and I went, holy cow, we're revolutionary. Those of us in the opera world, we've been told we're, it's a dying art form, we're stodgy, we need to reinvent ourselves, we need to find a way to become relevant in people's lives. We're taking totally the wrong track. You take young people today who are starving for something real. They don't know it necessarily, but everything is amplified, everything through electronics, everything is disconnected because everything is through a wireless connection somehow in a satellite way up in the heavens and we don't know how to talk face to face anymore. And all of a sudden they're hearing the human voice unamplified do something they've never heard it do before. And it's not auto-tuned. And I walked out of there and they flooded me afterwards. You would have thought I was Beyonce or something, which of course doesn't really happen in opera. You know, it happened in this weird setting. And I thought, we are revolutionary. And for me, that's what we need to play up. We need to take this product in its purest form, which means great, beautiful singing, amazing emotion, great theatrics, and we need to present it without apology, and we need to say, you have no idea what you're missing out on. That's sort of my approach to it. <laughs> uh, I was raised Catholic in the Midwest, you know, in Prairie Village, Kansas, suburb of Kansas City, and the word vocation was constantly present in our household. My father was the church choir director, volunteer for 45 years or something like that. And um, my mother was always baking the casseroles for the funerals and um, leading the rosary group and doing all these things. So volunteerism and, and vocation was really paramount. It wasn't be a success. It wasn't uh, make a lot of money. It was find your vocation. And it's, again, here we go back to this sort of clashing of different worlds, this conflict. I mean, look where, <laughs> look where I'm sitting right now. This is insane, right? I'm in Monte Carlo, uh, in one of the most gorgeous theaters in the world, and I'm speaking with you. It easily could get quite distorted for me. The glamour, the uh, prestige, fame, whatever. And I've, I think, very consciously set out to make sure that I don't buy into that very much because my shelf life in, in this field is probably, you know, I know it has a, a limit to it. I plan on making the most of it while I'm here and, and what is the sucking the marrow out of life, sucking the marrow out of this career as much as I can. Um, but I want to make sure that its purpose is very clear. I believe so deeply and profoundly in the power of music to touch people in a lot of ways. I know, I know that it has saved lives. I know it has changed lives. I know it has transformed them. It's given purpose to people. And I, I take that very seriously. So I do my primary job on the stage, and I do my best to make that happen. But I'm also happy to supplement it and, and to try and make sure that those who are interested, especially upcoming artists, um, that I can share some of my ideas, pass them on to them, and that then let them take it and make it their own, find their own way, which isn't just about becoming successful. It's quite boring. <laughs> I'm stubborn, I'm very stubborn, and I want to enjoy my life. I'm really clear on that. And the majority of my life is, is built around opera, whether it's in the rehearsal room or on the concert stage, and I would be miserable if it was a horrible existence all the time. It's not always easy. There are incredible demands and pressures. There's a lot of personalities that you meet. But I will say the majority of people that I know, to make it to this stage of opera, you have to be fiercely intelligent. You have to be fiercely um, good at working with people. Um, ego comes in, but. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, it's really based in an insecurity with people. You know, I think that's kind of a universal truth. And if I can help break that down early on in the rehearsal process and try and get to somebody's, to, to really connect with them, 
chances are we're gonna not only enjoy the performances better, but something bigger is gonna transmit through us to the audience. So maybe I'm a bully that way. I'm a, I'm a sunshine bully. I walk into the rehearsal room, I'm like, hello! You know, I, I, it's, I, it's just infinitely more enjoyable that way. Because who wants to hate their work? I don't. <laughs>